Uh, I first appeared on campus uh, in uh, 1967 and uh, this was to interview for the job and uh, the interview sequence started with the department I was going to be hired into and that was uh, the chemistry department and then the next uh, interview was uh, the division director with divisions at that time, it's all changed. And then uh, uh, my next interview was with a dean of faculties. And then finally there was one more, and this was with the president, Elmo Stevenson. So Elmo's, anybody knows, warriors, uh, so that, that name carried over since 1967. So then uh, I remember Elmo and he was also well known in town. He had good public relations with the rest of the town and so he said, oh you want to work here? Uh, I said, yeah, uh, I think I want to. And he said, oh so now I see you're well qualified where you came from. But I wanted to ask you, do you have children? I said, no, no, we don't have any. And he says, oh, well, now let me give you some good advice. He says, go down, drink lithia water, and do that for a whole week, every day, and then see what happens. And of course, I was new, I believed everything he said. I went and drank my lithia water down there at Lithia Park. And uh, it didn't taste very good, but uh, you know, I was new. I, I followed every single advice I did. And the surprising thing is that this actually worked. So uh, about a year later, yes, we started to have kids. So that, <laughs> now um, the chemistry department, uh, uh, the, at that time, it was totally teaching oriented, uh, no forced research, just uh, put your best effort into teaching. And that's why I came here, because that's what I wanted to do. Uh, yeah, so now the uh, institution, I kind of looked at it to see if I wanted to really come here. It had sort of a in the past had a bit of an identity crisis because first in 1956 after it had been normal school it became Southern Oregon College of Education and then uh, it changed its name to Southern Oregon College and then uh, in 1975 it became Southern Oregon State College so nobody could think we're a private college and then finally in 1997 it became SOU. Now this was almost about the time when I retired but I, I was glad to retire from a university rather than from a college. Uh, yeah now uh, the way that we taught in those days uh, was a little bit different um, one of the things we wanted our students to do is uh, since there were no electronic calculators around uh, they came in a little bit later and uh, so we wanted them to learn how to use a slide rule and that's completely gone out of style so just in case uh, people forget what a slide rule looks like it looks like like uh, this thing here. Uh, the middle is the slide and then there's a little cursor and it is based on the uh, the fact that when you add logarithms of numbers you multiply these numbers. So you can read off this slide rule 
how you add when you want to add the logs of numbers to also the, the logs to the base 10 and then you can read off uh, when you add something to it just uh, add the length of the slide to it and then read the antilog and then that gives you the right result for multiplication so uh, a lot of people that came they didn't know how to use a slide rule so we told everybody has to have a slide rule uh, because uh, the exams we're not gonna waste time on a big long hand multiplication you just learn how to do the slide rule so uh, we asked them to get one and uh, it doesn't have to be you know a big fancy there are smaller versions of it and then to also get this this little booklet that where they can uh, learn how to use this slide rule now this goes way back this little booklet was published first in 1953 uh, but still the, the slide rule became uh, more common for use in instruction and so those who didn't really uh, catch on to too fast we gave actually a, a little one hour course in how to use the slide rule and we had a big huge whoops <laughs> we had a big huge slide rule to hang on a wall so we hang this you know it's as big as a blackboard from one side to the other and demonstrated on the slide rule how to use that and uh, that then began to make sense uh, and uh, the slide rules were a challenge in itself but then uh, along came the first primitive electronic calculators and uh, <laughs> and so we thought no calculators we thought, oh, that was cheating I mean you, you couldn't use those uh, I mean all you do is just punch a bunch of buttons and out comes the result and uh, oh I remember one student's story um, so uh, I taught him when you when you do big problems and, and make the setup with multiplication and division uh, you should uh, first estimate what the result is going to be so you can tell whether it's a big number or a small number or whether it has an exponent uh, and so uh, once we allowed little electronic calculators there was one student and uh, he said I don't know why I got this problem wrong uh, I brought two calculators and the results are the same on both so how can it be wrong I says yeah well uh, you need uh, uh, of course take into consideration that uh, you're supposed to make a little estimate first to see what the number might be and then and then you punch in this stuff on your calculator uh, and uh, you know of course then the more advanced calculators you know they took care of all that you know with the decimal setting and and the exponent uh, and uh, so that that worked really well but the, when when we started to allow calculators then for the students to do their homework we had a little room set aside where they could hang out in the chem department and uh, and could do so, their homework and we furnished a little uh, electric Calc electronic calculator but we were afraid it's gonna you know it was a little bit bigger we was afraid it's going to get stolen so it screwed it down to the table <laughs> from underneath and uh, and so that we were so afraid that it would be such in such demand uh, and so they you know not, then of course the computers came along and uh, that that changed everything uh, calculators and computers and and you know smartphones etc that all that stuff didn't exist so we we came a, a long ways out of the dark ages of how to do problems while i was there uh, nobody in the whole building had a computer and then um, 
we started to have a central computer on campus but in order to get data in and out we had a we had a little console uh, and uh, we made a punch tape out of it and then we fed in the punch tape and then we could get some results punched back on the punch tape and then saw that on the display. Uh, when I was going to grad school, uh, we still did IBM cards. They were, had holes in them. And then took a whole box full of IBM cards to get the computing done and turn them in and then we could then get fed back the results uh, on a printout. And, uh, and of course, when you prepare those punch cards, if you made but one mistake, the whole thing didn't work. And it's, it, it's you can't read a punch card. I mean, what, what's this whole mean? This whole mean? So the proofreading of punch cards that was a job and a half by itself. Uh, yeah. So of course now, with with a, and then, oh, then the computers, the standalone. Uh, computers uh, that came a little bit later after on campus we didn't have the central computer anymore and then of course we could directly communicate with everybody else on campus now the exams were mostly uh, taken uh, by uh, filling out uh, a sheet that was uh, optically scanned and we had to take those sheets to the duplicating service to have them up scanned which meant that uh, they went through them and see which uh, which one was uh, filled in with a particular mark on a little bubble and uh, and so uh, what happened then with those exams, we turned them in to the duplicating services and we got them back with a printout uh, by social security number. Because uh, as always, those who took the exam, they wanted to know immediately, well, what did I make? So, uh, you know, that I had large classes to teach uh, the, the, the freshman uh, chemistry class in general chemistry was close to 200 and there was a hall big enough to hold them all but every seat was taken and there was some kind of a problem with uh, eyeballing and copying so many answers from the neighbor but uh, I told them uh, just just don't do that once in a while we call somebody and says, well, okay, you know, go sit in the first row and trade places with somebody else. And of course, that's then a, a personal exposure. Uh, and so we, we controlled it as well as we could. Now, when the exams uh, were upscanned and the results came back, we got a sheet, a printout by social security number. And of course, you, you bubbled in the, the social security number and then I posted those out in the hallway on the glass and oh they complained started rolling I don't want my social security number posted out there I says well okay so we'll just uh, use the last four digits so nobody can figure out which one it is and they said yeah well okay that we'll, we'll accept that uh, so then we posted that out there and uh, and before we got to that place of this advance of, uh, of upscanning, uh, we also had uh, similar answer sheets and we, we, we scored those by hand by making up a, a, a key and uh, cut out where the bubble is supposed to be filled in and then did some hand counting. Uh, so that of course used a lot of time uh, more the upscanning and uh, at the end of the first year of uh, general chemistry 
uh, we also handed out um, standardized exams that we got from the American uh, Chemical Society, the ACS, because the department uh, was accredited by the American Chemical Society uh, and you could then get this accreditation once you become a chemistry major. This was then part of your uh, part of your record. Uh, well now according to the rules of how we grade those exams uh, the uh, the rule was that it, it's a five choice exam. So uh, if you knew nothing and just marked everything like it's A through F, marked everything A, by chance you will probably get a fair number right without knowing anything. So in order to exclude the by chance error, uh, the, the, uh, the rule I exercised there is to count the number right minus one fourth the number wrong. Oh, that I ran into trouble with that. How come you're doing that? I mean, I got more right. How come you subtract? <laughs> yeah, well, that's, you know, to exclude the chance of getting one right by not knowing it. Uh, I got in big trouble with, with, with that. And uh, so I tried to explain it, you know, and they came in the, during office hours individually. How is that possible? Some actually did understand why this is so. Uh, but uh, uh, it was uh, it, it was a trying time uh, to get through this freshman course with the standardized exams on the end. Yeah. Um, so the uh, the other thing that happened is the department, the chemistry department, was growing, and it was enrollment driven. So the more enrollment we got, the more faculty we could employ, and. Uh, it kind of worked as long as it was growing. But then, of course, it reached a steady state and uh, it was pretty obvious. You can't just hire faculty and then fire them again when the enrollment goes down, like you turn on a faucet. It's just not, it just doesn't work. It's just not the humane way to do it. Um, so once in a while, uh, as a, as a department uh, faculty, we decide, well, instead of firing this guy for next year, why don't you go on sabbatical? And then we, we started out with uh, staggered sabbaticals so we could maintain uh, the number of faculty we wanted. So eventually, it, uh, that was number five, and then eventually the department grew to eight faculty members. Uh, it never did exceed that, and now it probably went back a little bit. Uh, I mean, enrollment at that time was not all that great for the whole institution, but uh, there were uh, a lot of students that came to take chemistry uh, as their science, you know, science requirement. Now, uh, there was one time when the U of O and the rest of the state system they were all on a semester system. So, SOC, SOSC, wanted to be like them, which meant uh, quarter to semester conversion. Now, that sounds easier than done, because you had your course material to cover uh, in, in any one course, so instead of having three quarters, we were supposed to reshuffle all of that so we could uh, teach that in two semesters. And so once we got all this stuff turned in, uh, so it, it would uh, make sense and all the uh, material converted to semesters, well, wouldn't you know, then the whole thing was called off. So now we wasted a lot of time and, and effort to do that, but uh, it just uh, it was just not. We just couldn't look like U of O 
uh, I mean, we, we just had to look like SOU. So, and we still do, and that's, uh, that's become a, 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 great, uh, a great name for it. Now, um, what did I do with uh, the students who were a little bit slower? And so the, the, they came in and says, well, you know, we want to we want to catch up and we want to do it everything else does because we didn't have all this background from high school that, that uh, some of them do and we do want to stay in chemistry. Um, so I says, well, okay, uh, we'll just do help sessions. So those of you who want to do a help session, uh, we'll do it voluntarily in the evening. You can come to that help session and even uh, at one point I remember uh, I went over to the dorm to meet with the students in the dorm so they didn't have to to come to uh, to the building uh, and this was uh, the building was uh, was seen as it is now it's a science unit one and the science unit two and uh, oh that was another thing with that building when I was hired uh, science unit two you know, it's all fancy with air conditioning and everything. Well, science unit two was not quite finished. So the first year, um, I needed to share a faculty office in science unit one, and uh, until we could move the office for next year. But oh, that building in early spring, it got so hot. And uh, so all we could do is just, uh, open up the windows, let more heat in, <laughs> and just live with it. And then when we wanted to really consult with, with students, uh, then uh, two of us sharing the office, uh, we, we scheduled it so the other guy could go somewhere else in the meantime because uh, that was just kind of disturbing each other. Yeah, so, uh, so eventually that worked out and uh, so we were so glad when we could go to finally move into Science Unit 2. So in the meantime, that's all corrected. The Science Unit 1 got remodeled, and everybody has their air conditioning, their own offices. Now, uh, the grading that I used was another little problem. The, uh, the way that uh, uh, I was convinced to grade, uh, to grade on a skewed curve, so that, uh, because it also reflects on my teaching ability, uh, how well a student did when they did the exams. And so I thought, well, okay, I'll grade on a skewed curve. And the students that came from other uh, courses uh, that they were enrolled in, they, they couldn't quite understand that. How, how come you're doing that? I mean, couldn't everybody make an A or a B that does well? It all depends. Uh, I'm, I'm grading on the curve. And they thought, what do you mean, curve? Well, so I said, okay, this is how it goes. The, uh, the top 20% will earn an A, the next 30% will earn a B, the next 40% will earn a C, and the next 10% will earn a D. Oh, I guess I'll have to really sit down and study hard or try to, to try to do well. Uh, and so finally I probably uh, broke down a little bit and said, well, you know, what you can do if you see a D coming up until it's possible with the registrar, you can withdraw and get a W. You can uh, repeat the course at a later date. You can get incomplete to just drop out of the course. So uh, with those uh, ways out, uh, I didn't have to give any Fs. I hated uh, the thought of giving somebody an F. Uh, and also, of course, uh, I turned, uh, I passed around the attendance sheet so they could, uh, they could sign in on the attendance sheet. And actually they, they were, uh, in general, they were honest in not signing somebody else's uh, name as being here. 
and I looked at the attention sheet, uh, uh, you know, when they came for help and says, well, have you been to the lecture? Oh, how many have you missed so far? And, uh, and so uh, the other thing I did is I kept grade books for all the homework. I had the homework all graded. Sometimes I had a helper, a, a, a student helper, to, you know, for uh, work study money uh, to help me grade the homework. And a lot of that was hand grading. Uh, and also with the exams, I remember taking home uh, after uh, at the close of the day, big stamps, uh, uh, stacks of exam paper, papers, and sat there in the evening grading all those. And of course, they wanted to know as soon as I could, uh, to, to, uh, they wanted their exam back, see what they made. And, uh, and so that's, of course, that led up to the upscan sheet because that was just too much work. And to uh, hand exams back, I didn't want to use up lecture time, uh, you know, ahead of uh, a 50-minute lecture to, to hand out the exams. So I just piled them all, spread them all out on the front desk and just come get it, here it is. And you know, it only took five minutes and all the exams had disappeared and there was never a complaint. Uh, they didn't just take each other's exam or it, it all worked out uh, great that way. Um, yeah, so uh, then uh, my biggest satisfaction I, I get out of teaching, uh, my biggest satisfaction was to uh, make him understand chemistry maybe even love chemistry and then continue uh, in chemistry in the second and third year and uh, and uh, some of the uh, feedback I got you know personally says oh I'm so glad that you were able to explain all that you know I didn't I didn't have a clue I thought chemistry was not it was a chem mystery rather than, than something to know uh, so I got a lot of personal satisfaction from that. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the way, of course, uh, that I wanted to teach the first year chemistry is to, to make sure that they continued so we would get enough people ke uh, majoring in chemistry. And, uh, and then also to see uh, how I really did with, uh, with my teaching, uh, there were evaluations filled out by the, by the students. And so they could score various categories, you know, prepared for lecture, uh, gained an understanding, uh, so any, et cetera, et cetera. There were like about, like about 10 or 15 questions like that with a score between, uh, uh, I forgot the high school, like between a 10 and uh, a zero. Uh, you know, applies or sort of applies. And, and so uh, then uh, those teacher evaluations, somebody else handed out. I couldn't do it myself. Somebody else handed it out in class for me and then collected them and, uh, and came up with a count. And uh, so then uh, in my professional evaluation, I could write down, okay, my average score was this or that. And my average score was usually, after a while, after I figured out how to really teach chemistry, it was pretty high. Um, now, you know, to walk into my first classroom is my first lecture. Once I got employed, uh, I was kind of nervous about it, and uh, I learned how to maybe just make it more appreciable and calm down my nerves. And 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 each time, every single lecture, I was well prepared. You know, for every lecture, I probably spent two, three hours to get prepared for it. Uh, of course, a second year, third year, 
it became easier with the same course. And uh, and sometimes, you know, we changed books. Uh, but the, the books were uh, such that they were at the level where we needed to have them in order to to get through the first year of uh, of freshman chemistry. Uh, yeah, so, uh, well, what else do I have? Uh, well, yeah, back then there was actually a faculty lounge, and uh, uh, we didn't go there much, uh, but in a department what we did, we all sat around a big table in a conference room, and we all had lunch together. And, uh, and also during the same time, sometimes we had department meetings, uh, that were organized meetings, and uh, and then uh, um, the by the the faculty lounge. Uh, I went down there a few times. It was down there at the uh, Stevenson Union, and uh, and associated with with other faculty. But uh, you know, it was kind of sort of yeah. Well, we don't have good relations with other departments. <laughs> Uh, for some reason, you know, they, some of the other departments says, oh yeah, well, you're the guys up the hill, you're looking down on us. Yeah, well, not really, but uh, yeah, we are up <laughs> on the hill. Yeah, so there was a little bit of, uh, of in-house, uh, a little bit of a discrimination going on, but nothing real serious. In, in, uh, in the chem department, it was all male. Uh, until about oh the mid 80s when we finally wound up uh, uh, hiring a, a, everybody was supposed to have a PhD and we did find a, a chemistry PhD to hire and uh, actually she uh, she's close to retirement now yeah and she she stayed and uh, and you know we didn't have any uh, any gender discrimination in the department, uh, and it, it was equal pay because there was a, a pay scale established for the state, you know, and uh, so uh, at least for this campus. So if you get hired in with with a PhD, then this is step one. This is where you start, and then once you're here a year or two, then you go to the next step and the next step and so on. Yeah, and then. Uh, and then of course they had these, there were these rules, and I think that they might still be in place, uh, where the minimum before you could get promoted from an assistant professor to an associate professor, the minimum was uh, was uh, three years, and then the next minimum to, before you got a full, and each time of course you get a a, a salary increase. And the next uh, minimum period was five years to be uh, to be promoted a full professor. So, um, and that that pretty much uh, we followed. And sometimes people tried it earlier, and most of the time that didn't work. Yeah, because you had to fill out a big long application uh, to be promoted, and you have to show you know your professional activities. Yeah. So yeah. That's a, a big thing that uh, <coughs> some others have talked about. <coughs> In the chemistry department, yes, that's not really true for every uh, department. But then, if they did not have what was called the terminal degree, which is the PhD for anybody in all the science departments, then they were hired in on a temporary basis, one year at a time, as an instructor. And, and during that time, they were supposed to then complete uh, their requirements uh, for the PhD. Do you remember celebrations when faculty would finally complete a degree? Did, did they, were they congratulated on campus? Was that communicated out? Oh, uh, well, uh, mostly, mostly not. Um, what happened is, of course, if you were hired in as an instructor, and then you completed all your sh your uh, requirements to uh, to get the PhD awarded, then 
As for promotion, you again you have to fill out a big long application and show to show why, other than complete a degree, why you should be now changed into an assistant professor. Yeah, I I don't really personally understand why this should be case. You know, if if you are an excellent teacher and if you could really uh, make it count that you were there and the students really liked you and you knew your stuff, uh, I, I don't see the, the principle of having the, to be a PhD to get in. But that was just a, a general agreement, you know, that's, and of course uh, the, the problem is uh, none of us knew how to teach. We didn't have a, any uh, any training in teaching. I mean, we just worked for the degree and did research somewhere else, and and uh, we're glad to get the final degree to get fully qualified to come to a college of our choice. And uh, the uh, uh, yeah, so the uh, the 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 pressure was to have the degree, but not to knowing how to teach classes. And uh, it, it took, uh, I mean, I had done a secondary teaching degree in secondary school, so I had some little practice as to how to talk to students. But uh, a lot of people that get hired or got hired, uh, they had a tough time to get through the first year or two to, you know, to, to get the, get used to dealing with students and uh, and I, I came with some uh, some prejudice also I, you know that I thought the students were real students that they should know something <laughs> but then I gave that up after a while I mean it was for me to teach them uh, rather than assuming that they already know something and of course they you know the high schools here they you know you got out of high school but uh, whoever did not pass high school so of course they some of the uh, students that, that came to college you know, the acceptance rate is, was like uh, 78 or 80 uh, percent when you applied to come to to SOU um, they really didn't know for sure what they were facing and, uh, and of course you know step up from uh, from what, what the expectations were. And uh, so there was always uh, the, uh, I had some discussions with many students, is, that's too much homework. How much homework do you expect me to do? I says, well, for every time that you come to class, you should be doing at least two hours worth of homework. Oh, I don't know that I can really manage it through the week to do all that, you know, by the time at 12 or 15 uh, grade hours, and then that would amount to about 30 more hours. That would be like 45 hours that I'm supposed to, uh, uh, to dedicate to schoolwork. It says, yeah, that's uh, it's about a full work. Well, how about my social life? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, maybe you should then deal with it and uh, subtract it from your social life. And uh, they thought that was really important, yeah. With some of the students that uh, were there for four years, uh, and even if they didn't complete the four years in chemistry, uh, we stayed in touch. And, uh, and of course, uh, stayed in touch because they were nice guys and really got into some significant uh, jobs or even started running their own companies or got into graduate school. A lot of them went, uh, uh, went after they have a chem major, went to medical school. Uh, and uh, some of those uh, then started to practice medicine back here in Ashland. And matter of fact, uh, my dentist uh, is a graduate and he went through my courses and he went to dental school and came up 
uh, back to, to Medford to set up a, a dental practice. And so when I first went into his office, he said, uh, how did you find me? I said, oh, well, I looked you up to see who is a, who would be a, a, great, a great dentist. And I found your name and recognized it. And he said, uh, did you look at my grades before you came here? And I saved all of my grade books. I still have them. And I said, I sure did. <laughs> and he started to apologize uh, that the first quarter he did great. But then he said, oh, yeah, second quarter, I didn't make an A. I just made a B in the other two quarters because I loaded myself too much down with, uh, with math and physics and biology that he wanted to, to get in order to go on to dental school. And, uh, and so, uh, so she, he, uh, he told his, uh, his dental assistant that story and she just laughed. <laughs> he said, is that right? You know, that far back, you know, this guy? I said, yeah, that far back. Yeah. Another question I have. That building was completed in 1958, but you said Science 1 and Science Science two. 1 and 2, yeah. So there was an expansion of that building? Yeah, uh, the, the Science Unit 1 had gotten just, uh, it was a growing, uh, growing college, and it just gotten too tight to have all of the faculty offices uh, for uh, biology and chemistry and physics and geology, all in the same building. And uh, it was a, it was a, a four-story building, and so it was by story. Uh, geology was down in the bottom, close to the rocks, and and then uh, biology was up on top. And uh, biology department was uh, was quite a bit bigger. And uh, yeah, and then physics was a was a small a small department. So that's how we lived with each other in a, a science building. Yeah, and of course, uh, chemistry uh, wound up on the second floor. What, tell me about the labs. What were the labs like, and were were there ever any? Did you ever have funding problems with the labs? Did you ever have any, like? fires. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, so uh, I remember some of the labs that we did, and uh, and so uh, in the lab, everybody got a lab locker and got inventoried and uh, was not supposed to break anything. And uh, then, of course, if they, the students broke something, you had to pay out of pocket to replace that item. Uh, yeah, and then uh, and then we had a lab manual that was written in-house, and we used that. And so experiment number two, you know, and they followed the instructions, and, uh, and, and so I said, yeah, follow the instructions very carefully. Well, uh, there was one instance when, uh, uh, when we were uh, uh, learning how to use a pipette. And so we had a rubber bulb and, uh, and a pipette was like 25 milliliters. And I said, so uh, you have to be careful so you don't suck anything into the bulb because it might contaminate the reagent. Uh, and, uh, and do not do any mouth pipetting. Although I love to do it myself. <laughs> I was, but uh, I didn't demonstrate that, you know, during the lab lecture. Uh, well. This uh, this one gal, uh, and we were pipetting sodium hydroxide at the time. So uh, she uh, didn't follow instructions with the bulb and no mouth. She did mouth pipetting, and she got a mouthful of sodium hydroxide, and uh, and she said, "Oh, my lips are burning so bad." I says, well, immediately get out of the fresh water, you know, get your mouth all rinsed with fresh water. But, you know, the, the, the burning uh, will probably take a while 
uh, so go over to the health center and have them help you. So we, we took that, that student, it was a she, over to the health center. And uh, so she learned how to not do mouth pipetting any, anymore the hard way. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, let's see, we had one, uh, one explosion going on. Uh, I forget what set it off. Uh, somebody just put their wrong stuff together. Uh, so that one, yeah, that one exploded and actually there was, uh, it exploded so bad that uh, there was a piece of, of glass that got broken and, and left a little mark in the ceiling. <laughs> So fortunately, you know, they were supposed to use uh, goggles in the laboratory so they would knock out their eyes. And that was a good thing. Yeah. Tell, tell me about the, um, the, the, how the campus felt. Did you all, I've heard stories of faculty going to Yeah, I think uh, I'm pretty well uh, to the end of uh, what I remember most uh, about my years. Uh, I retired uh, in, uh, I'd say I'm now 20, 20 years retired. I, I taught for 30 years. So, uh, so I retired toward the end of uh, 1998 or 1999, and it was kind of a phased in retirement. I think that that's the way it still is possible to, to teach part-time toward the end and then retire fully. But once I retired, uh, I thought about it and of course I had to kind of let the administration know when I was going to retire so they could figure out whether to replace me or not. Um, then I retired, and then the first uh, few weeks after I retired, and I thought, why did I do that? I mean, I lost my job. So I became envious of everybody who retired that hated their job. So I lost my job and said, oh man, I should have just stayed in there and just uh, retire later. And I wasn't, I was just 60. I could have stayed another five years and, and, and maybe be fine with it, but uh, I still, even to this day, I still miss going to work and teaching my classes. Uh, some of the uh, upper division classes, uh, I mean the, the freshman classes, they were always every year, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 11 o'clock. And uh, I, we had to make sure that they don't conflict with some other classes that uh, the science students were also taking. Uh, but then some of these others, I, I had to schedule them at 8 o'clock in the morning. And uh, because of conflicts with other classes uh, that sh were supposed to be taken uh, by the students that were going in the, the science major direction. Yeah, and, uh, and that uh, was not a popular hour. I mean, at, uh, it was okay for me, I'm an early riser anyway. But I said, oh, couldn't you get a later hour? I says, well, that's all that's available. So eventually I got by with it. And, uh, and the students uh, did know that if I take that class, it's gonna be at eight o'clock. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And, uh, and of course the other thing is, uh, where I lived here in Ashland, uh, every morning, at the same time, I was walking down, you know, for my daily exercise, I was walking down uh, from my house and took uh, from my door, out the door, into the chemistry department door, took 23 minutes. <laughs> so I knew exactly when to leave. And, uh, and then some of the people that saw me walk by there, that lived along the way, uh, they said, you know, I don't need a clock anymore. I can, I can just set my clock by when you're walking by. <laughs> and, uh, and also in the evening, I, you know, I stayed until five o'clock, sometimes a little bit later, and, and, then, uh, and then walked back, back home. And uh, yeah, and then we had office hours. 
we're supposed, we're supposed to have uh, uh, f five office hours a week and schedule those accordingly. So I scheduled office hours where students could come in and, and uh, ask me anything. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, and those uh, were pretty popular. Sometimes I had a waiting line outside the door until the, the, person, the student that was in my office was done. And, uh, and so I was, uh, I was just glad to be able to help students in their learning. Yeah, so uh, that's about the, the end of my story. So this slide rule is based on the addition of log of a number to the base 10, add another log to it, and then from the sum take the anti-log, and that is the multiplication done. And uh, the results are all shown on the same slide rule that uh, you, you take a beginning of a number somewhere like this, and then you add uh, the log of a number, then you add another log of a number, and then you put that under, and then uh, the result is going to be the addition of the two, and then you read that off uh, as the result is the anti-log, and that is the multiplication of two numbers. And division works the same thing, except to subtract the logs from each other. So that's.